What I want to do this morning is basically three key things. Um, first of all, I want to talk briefly um, about the character of military strategy per se, or how strategists normally define what it is that they're looking at. Then I want really to discuss the manner in which in uncertainty and complexity make the practice of strategy a risky endeavor. And um, in particular, how technology has been by, uh, used by the military to try and overcome some of these problems. The military are typically very keen on technical, technical fixes to problems of risk and uncertainty. Um, and typically, they don't work very well, but we'll see why perhaps in a minute. Finally, what I want to do is tie these issues together with um, a brief discussion of the present war in Iraq, which is causing tremendous problems for strategists at the moment. I think probably it qualifies as a wicked problem. I've not come across the term before, but it sounds about right, I think, for Iraq. Um, it occurs to me what I'm not going to do today is talk about terrorism, um, but I'm, I'm willing to answer questions about Al Qaeda and its attitudes to risk and uncertainty in question and answer afterwards. It's a bit of a gap in my presentation, but I have some ideas about this that I've been thinking about recently, not least because we all may be on the receiving end of some of their um, um, activities. So the risk and uncertainty issues have a personal flavour, I think, um, in some of these instances. Okay, let me start then by defining what strategy is, or how strategists understand strategy. Typically, they want to think in terms of strategy being the instrumental link between military ends, um, military means, sorry, and political ends. So if you put that slightly differently, um, strategy really is about the processes by which armed force, the armed forces of our states, or terrorists, or whatever, how that armed force gets translated into political effects. This suggests to me that strategy really is a form of planning, in as much as it involves the systematic allocation of means to ends, force to political ends. Um, but in order to understand what makes strategy, military strategy, a particularly challenging form of um, planning, we need to bear two additional considerations in mind. The first of these is the fact that military planning must be conducted um, with a sentient adversary in mind. Strategists must draw up their plans for wars, um, plans that anticipate and in a sense preempt their adversaries likely responses. In consequence, strategists are constantly having to ask themselves questions of the following kind. How is my adversary going to respond to my initiatives? How should I amend my plans in order to take the enemy's responses into account? Bearing in mind that my adversary will be expecting me to modify my plans um, to accommodate his responses, how should I proceed? And uh, you can see, you can get into a quite quickly get into a sort of infinite regression there, which um, is a problem in itself, actually. So the first consideration we need to bear in mind, then, is the notion of a sentient adversary, adversarial relationships that must be brought, taken into account when um, drawing up your plans. <coughs> the second consideration is one of cost sensitivity. Um, action designed to achieve one's political objectives in the face of opposition can rapidly rise in cost and effort, for reasons which we'll see very shortly. A countervailing pressure in this regard is the requirement to achieve our political objective without, um, without incurring disproportionate costs in the process. Costs, um, they mustn't outweigh benefits if you're going to treat war as a rational tool of policy. Yeah? If costs outweigh benefits, um, then war can no longer be seen as a rational choice political leaders. Now, to tie these ideas together, what I want to do is consider an example that I often run with my students, which is on the reverse of your uh, handout here. This is the scenario. I should say lots of military strategy is scenario based, which is quite interesting to hear what Shell was talking about earlier on. Um, <clears throat> apologies to the Germans in the audience, I have Spielstadt in the middle here, which is saying. Uh, um, <clears throat> But this is basically the situation that I want you to consider. There are two states in the world, red and blue, which are the traditional military. Um, we're always blue, and the baddies are always red. So we're going to take the, the role of the baddies in this particular instance. The international border 
runs down the middle of the page between the two states and nestled in a little <coughs> enclave is the little hamlet of Spielstadt. In this version, it's got a population of 25 people, less than two cows, but we'll, we'll ignore the cows. The Red Army, population of uh, 10,000 soldiers, Blue Army, 10,000 soldiers. None. I'm not going to run through this example and elicit responses for you, because it can take a long time, actually, especially with my undergraduates. But I'll, I'll just try and work through this systematically for you, to give you some, uh, some idea of the sort of dynamic processes that underpin strategic decision making. What I typically ask the students to think about is to put them place, put themselves in place of the commander of Red Army with its 10,000 soldiers. And they're given the job. Their political leadership says to them, what I want you to do, my political objective this week, is to annex Spielstadt. This is what I want. That's the political aim. And the role of the commander of Red Army is to formulate a strategy that will permit him to use force to achieve the political objective. So there are two levels of analysis that are working here. First of all, there is the political aim, annexation. And secondly, there is the operationalization of that political aim in ways that allow you to achieve it via the use of force. The questions that you need to think about more specifically are what is the operational goal, the strategic operational goal of your army going to be? And the second point is, what percentage of your army are you going to commit to this particular operation? Now, <coughs> there are two key stages in working through this particular problem. Um, the first one um, is to get to the realisation that what you need to do in order to be sure of annexing Spielstadt, or as certain as you can, is basically to use the totality of the force available to you. So your 10,000 soldiers must be committed to the operation. And the goal of your army is not necessarily anything to do with Spielstadt itself. What you need to do is seek out and destroy Blue's army. And there are some good reasons for that. If you use only an increment of the force available to you, if you were to use 1,000 soldiers in the pursuit of your political objective, you always run the risk that the enemy, Blue in this case, will decide to use more of his force, commit more of his force than you do. So there is always the problem that if you use an increment of your force, the other side may in fact decide <coughs> to commit more of its total force to the war. Now, this kind of interdependent decision-making kind of idea pushes generals in, in particular to think about using the maximum amount of force they have available in order to ensure that they will never be at an unnecessary disadvantage in relation to the enemy. It pushes the use of force out to a maximum. <coughs> and of course, the way to be most certain about capturing Spielstadt is to make the enemy's means of resistance, the enemy's army, to destroy it, to make the enemy defenseless. Because if the enemy's means of resistance have been destroyed, you can achieve whatever political objective you wish in relation to the enemy. So this is the notion then that the interdependent decision-making aspect of strategy tends to recommend maximal, <clears throat> maximal solutions. Use as much force as you can with the object of causing as much destruction to the enemy as you can. However, what you need to do, having come to this conclusion, is to think through the broader consequences, to relate back your plan to the broad political aims that you have in mind. And this is why Spielstadt has been chosen here with this population of 25 people. But the political value that your leadership places on Spielstadt means that getting involved in a war in which you're committing 10,000 soldiers to the destruction of Blue's 10,000 soldiers means that the costs associated with that particular operation are very, very likely to outweigh any benefits that are accruing. So here we get the issue of cost sensitivity coming back in. The political context of the war, in other words, the political aim, why you are going to war, exerts quite an important influence over what you do in war, the cost that you're likely to run. If there was a uranium mine under Spielstadt, the cost-benefit calculus would change, perhaps. The 25 people wouldn't be so important, the uranium ore might be considered more important, and you might, as, you might then, as a result, get this go-ahead from your government to commit yourself to a 
more major operation, which runs the risks of incurring greater costs. But Spielstadt represents a problem. You might want it back, but on the other hand, the costs of doing anything about it are very, very likely to outweigh the benefits associated with annexing the place in the first instance. Very simple example, but that basically is the kind of tension that military strategists always have to try and juggle. There are risks associated with not doing enough in terms of the application of force. If you don't hit your enemy as hard as you can, you risk the fact that your enemy will not show a reciprocal level of restraint and will hit you back harder. So the military tend to push to, um, towards plans that make as much use of force as possible. Interestingly, militaries are often reluctant to go to war in the first place as well. They don't like the notion of going to war. They're very much aware of the, the costs, the hidden costs, and so forth. Um, so often they have to be dragged or pushed into war by politicians. But once they go to war, the military then want to go all out and use as much force as possible. Um, and that's when the politicians begin to get quite queasy about the fallout associated with what they're doing. So often the analogy would be, imagine the, the military is a boulder, and the politicians are trying to push this boulder uphill to get them to go to war. It's a tough process for politicians. Once the boulder gets to the top, and it starts to roll down to the side where war starts, politicians have a difficult problem reining the process in. So there's always then this tension between what politicians want to be able to achieve through the use of force and um, what their, the means available and the antagonistic uh, relationship between two armed forces can produce. A good strategy, then, is really one which seeks to navigate its way between these two extremes. The risks associated with doing too much and the risks associated with not doing enough. A good strategy has to navigate its way between those two kinds of extremes. And one thing it needs, needs in order to be able to achieve this is some sense of how one's opponent is going to react in practice. If we think of the Spielstadt example, um, it isn't half useful to know a little bit about how much value you think your opponent places on retaining Spielstadt under his control, because that then allows you to calculate the kinds of cost-benefit analyses that are going on the, in the enemy's head, and to pitch your use of force if you go to war in such a manner as to run the risk, um, or sorry, to avoid running the risk so that you are not going to be using too little force. Let me give you a more concrete example of what I mean. It is clearly, from the example we have here, disproportionate to commit the totality of your armed forces to the capture of Spielstadt. What you might therefore decide to do as a result of this is to run the risk of committing a mere increment of your force. For point of argument, you put a thousand soldiers into the operation. The goal of that thousand soldiers might be to physically operate, uh, to physically capture Spielstadt. So you make a surprise attack, occupy the place, and then you stop. Now, the advantages with this approach is that you are not committing an undue percentage of your armed forces to combat. The disadvantage is that you are leaving the enemy intact to strike back at you. And therefore, you are opening yourself up to the risk that you're not quite clear what the enemy will do and how much force he will use as a result. It might be that the enemy decides, well, I'd like to retain Spielstadt, but unfortunately, Red is the initiative. He's got his thousand soldiers in there, and I don't think that Spielstadt, I don't value it enough to fight to retain it. So I'm going to say, sorry, we've lost Spielstadt, but we're not going to fight. So we'll accept our loss when we will peace treaty, peace negotiations. That might be the case. On the other hand, you do run the risk that if you commit a thousand soldiers, the enemy in blue says, this is really annoying. Spielstadt's only got 25 people in it, but my wife comes from Spielstadt. Yes? What will my mother-in-law think if I don't do something serious about this? <laughs> 
Um, so you, you, you open yourself up to that vulnerability, that the enemy may say, Spiel is in the face of it, I don't really want to retain it, but there are strong domestic pressures, yes, for me doing something. So Red has committed a thousand soldiers, I'm going to commit five thousand, they're destroying, yeah, reoccupy the place. And therefore, you can see that you need to balance the risks associated with how much force you commit um, with the risks that if you don't commit sufficient force, the enemy will do something that will trump whatever it is you were trying to do in the first place. And you will, nothing other than costs will be incurred by you. The way forward from this, and this is what most military strategists will tell the military all the time, um, most civilian strategists, I should say, is that you really need to know your enemy as well as you can. Because if you know your enemy, you can make much finer, much more careful judgments about the risks associated with using an increment of your own force. And by knowing the enemy, I don't mean simply knowing where his assets are, where his soldiers are, how many he has, but really the character of the enemy, um, his motivations, what he's like, how likely he is to commit himself to war. Victory and defeat often hinge on this kind of um, issue. And I'll, I'll just give you a couple of historical case studies which will put a little bit of flesh on these bones. Um, the first one is 1962. The Cuban Missile Crisis, which is one of the most exciting points in the Cold War. Um, I wasn't there, but I'm told that it was... Um, Cuba was probably the closest um, the United States and the Soviet Union had come to war. The problem was, maybe, if you don't know, I'll just briefly outline the situation. The problem was that the United States got wind of the fact, it learned of the fact that the Soviet Union and the Khrushchev was planning to um, set up ballistic missiles in Cuba. Now, Cuba is only a short distance from the American mainland, and the worry was that Soviet missiles in Cuba with nuclear warheads would introduce a huge level of vulnerability to the United States that hadn't previously been there. Kennedy, who was president at the time, had to think about what he was going to do in reaction to this problem. He asked his military what they thought he ought to do, and the military were unanimous, bomb Cuba completely, flatten Cuba, and then, just for good measure, we invade it, amphibious invasion. The military's logic was impeccable in the sense that a crisis situation like this, nuclear missiles appearing in Cuba, you have to act. You have to act decisively and rapidly to remove the threat. If you do anything less than remove the threat, you just leave the enemy with the ability to retaliate. Now, Kennedy considered this, asked his civilian advisors what he should do. The civilian advisor says, yes, we can see the military's logic here, but what we want to do is think about whether we can actually achieve a resolution to this crisis without actually using all this force. Who knows what will happen? if nuclear weapons are thrown into a war, into an equation. We don't know what's going to happen. Let's try and bargain, negotiate with Krestov. We'll threaten him. We'll threaten him that we will use force against him. Now, that leaves him with the initiative. But what Kennedy's advisors thought was that Khrushchev, having studied him very carefully, would back down, particularly if the Americans gave him a way out of the crisis that he could say, yes, I've achieved something for the good of the Soviet Union. Kennedy is impressed by this advice. So what he says basically to Khrushchev is, stop deploying your missiles in Cuba or we'll bomb you. Leaving the initiative then to Khrushchev. What will he do? And ultimately Khrushchev backs down. Now, the reason he backs down is to do in large part with his personality. He's a very closely analysed figure. Um, he was one for bluster and threats, and he had a habit of making promises that he didn't carry through. So he was very closely watched by Kremlin watchers in the United States. And the other thing that the Kennedy administration did was to offer to remove some of the United States missiles, which were based in Turkey at the time. Turkey, quite close to the Soviet Union, so the deal was, yeah, you remove your missiles from Cuba, we'll remove our missiles from Turkey. You've got something, we've got something, no war. Kennedy, therefore, and his civilian advisors, I think, must take the credit for the fact that they were able to come up with a strategy that involved 
a highly politicised application of force, just the mere threat that it would be used under certain circumstances, leaving the initiative to the Russians, figuring out that the risk of um, Khrushchev starting a war over this issue was minimal. If war started, if the United States stepped in, the costs were likely to massively outweigh benefits. And that's the first example. It's a good example of how knowing what your enemy is like, how he operates, what his values are, is very, very useful for strategy. Um, the second example I will run through very briefly is Vietnam. Vietnam, which really, the Americans became interested in Vietnam in a military sense in about 1965, the mid-1960s. Kennedy by this time was dead, and he'd been replaced by his Vice President um, Johnson. Yeah. Now, Vietnam had been split into two states, North, which was aligned with the communist world, and South, which was on the side of the good era. And the problem in Vietnam was that the North Vietnamese were sponsoring an insurgency in the South. The political context was that hopefully Vietnam could be unified into a single state under the communist sphere of influence, or at least under the Vietnamese version of Marxism at the time. The military, Johnson asked for advice. He said, what should we do in order to prevent the North from sponsoring and supporting this insurgency in the South? The military said, destroy North Vietnam. And that, that quotation marks around that, that's literally their response. They said, the only way you're going to solve this problem is if you bomb the North flat. We have the capability, um, we can do it. <coughs> 30 days intensive operations and the South will be saved. Johnson says, prompted by his advisors, what about the Chinese? The Chinese we know are giving aid at this point to the Vietnamese. What would happen if we bombed North Vietnam flat? What would the Chinese do? The military reckoned the Chinese would intervene. Johnson says, what do we do if the Chinese intervene? The military say, well, we've got nuclear weapons. It's not a problem, yeah? Plenty of bombs, lots of Chinese, but we'll win. Um, Johnson says, I don't think that's a great idea. Right? We're not going to do that. He's, an, he's, he's very much alert to the risks of doing too much. Yeah? But trying to save South Vietnam by provoking nuclear war is a disproportionate military act. So he takes a risk. <coughs> what he says is, we won't bomb North Vietnam completely flat. We will coerce them. And the, the phrase that was used at the time was coercive diplomacy. So you say to Hanoi, capital of North Vietnam, let's sit down and talk about the future of the South. And Hanoi ignores you, so you bomb them a bit. Yeah? And you hit various targets in North Vietnam that you think are valuable to the regime. Bridges are a good example. Yes? You bomb bridges in North Vietnam because bridges have a profound impact on economic performance and the ability of the military to carry on its mission. So you bomb some bridges. But really, the object of that operation is not to cause too much inconvenience, but to send a message. <laughs> if you don't talk to us, there will be more to follow. So this is coercive diplomacy. Johnson reckoned, supported in part by his defence secretary, Robert McNamara, who's a very famous, um, there's something into about planning, actually, um, that Hanoi could be made to talk by this coercive application of force they could be made to be brought to the peace table and peace could be gained on American terms. What happened was though, that McNamara and, and, uh, and Johnson were both wrong. The, the North Vietnamese were just not interested in talking at all. The assumption that they were rational actors operating along some cost-benefit calculus that um, rational choice economists are uh, were quite influential in US foreign policy at this point. Um, the assumption that these, the North Vietnamese were rational in that regard, was horrible. The Vietnamese regime was 100% committed to the reunification of Vietnam. In fact, historically speaking, it saw its struggle in the 1960s as the end phase in a 2,000 year struggle to be free of foreign oppression. So they weren't about to give in at the end of uh, 2,000 years of fighting. And of course, what happens is the United States, because it shows restraint, it uses a smaller increments of force in this war than it could otherwise have done, gets beaten as a result. Yeah? The Vietnamese show no restraint. 
they just simply take an advantage. They take advantage from the restraints that the North Americans show, sorry, the Americans show, to strike back all the harder. And really, by about 1968, the war has been lost by the United States and won by North Vietnamese. So, if you're going to show restraint, and you really do have to in the context of cost-benefit analyses in relation to strategy, it doesn't help pay to know what is motivating your enemy. What it would have been extremely useful for the Americans to know was that there was no way they could get involved in the war in North Vietnam without actually destroying North Vietnam totally. You, you, the United States Joint Chiefs of Staff were absolutely correct, but they were absolutely correct for the wrong reasons in the sense, not that they knew anything about North Vietnam, but they had their own technical idea in mind of what it takes to win, and winning means making the enemy defenseless. They were right in that regard. So Johnson really misunderstood the situation, and therefore, we have only two choices available to America in this particular war, either stay out altogether or to destroy North Vietnam. So knowing your enemy, a very, very important lesson here. The second consideration is one of um, complexity. Now, it's universally realized by soldiers, anybody who has any dealings with them, that military organizations themselves and the operations that they undertake are extremely complex exercises. Um, strategic theorists normally use the term friction to capture the effects or the barriers to efficiency which complexity impose on military operations as a result. The idea is that because military operations are so complex, they are constantly exposed to the effects of chance. That whatever you plan to do, um, a bit like today, I suppose, really, whatever you plan, something will intervene, yes, to mess things up. And that often, the best laid plans can go awry as a result of the effects of chance and complexity, even before the enemy intervenes. A good example in 1991, the United States deploys half a million soldiers to the desert. Um, Saudi Arabia in its operations to take back um, Kuwait from the Iraqis. That's half a million soldiers plumped into the desert with all their equipment. Which is an interesting exercise for urban planners, I suppose. Yeah? <laughs> How do you create a small town yes, in the middle of the desert um, with very little in the way of infrastructure? There's not much there apart from sand. Yeah? But it, that aside, once you started getting assembling half a million soldiers and all the infrastructure they required. One of the interesting things that happened was the number of road traffic accidents that occurred. Large numbers of road traffic accidents. This was before the war proper started. And in fact, the number of soldiers killed as a result of them driving into each other in jeeps and so forth was larger than the number of casualties that they sustained in the war itself. So simply having an army of half a million soldiers introduces tremendous amounts of complexity and exposes you to chance in a way that is difficult to deal with. What gave the United States their advantage once the war got underway? Once they attacked the Iraqi forces that were located in Kuwait, um, what gave them their superiority was really their, their superior technique. Um, one way of thinking about technology or technique is, or its influence, is one that reduces the influence of chance or friction on the operation of armed forces. It, it, as a result of which it increases the efficiency with which you operate. And you can see that if you are significantly more efficient than your enemy, your opponent, then as a result of this, um, you're going to have a significant advantage over him. And this, in fact, was the case in 1991. But the Iraqi armed forces were simply not very good at complex operations, whereas the United States armed forces, this is what they've trained for for decades. And their technology was well capable of managing some of the effects of chance and complexity 
um, that they encountered. A great example is a smart bomb. If you watched 1991 war on telly, the thing that you were bombarded with was images of bombs flying down chimneys and into bunkers and destroying tanks and this kind of stuff. And the idea being here is that because these smart bombs were actually guided, they were guided by a laser beam onto a target, their accuracy is far greater than the, than the unguided version that you drop in large quantities and rely on some statistical measure of effectiveness to hit your target. So one bomb, one bunker, um, meant that the United States Armed Forces were far more efficient than the Iraqis could hope to be. Their operations, in other words, <coughs> were complex, were less exposed to the effects of chance as a result of this. Okay, pushing on a little bit. The 1991 spectacular military victory for the Iran Force, US Armed Forces in the Gulf. Um, one consequence of this, um, and this is where Rumsfeld comes back in, actually, um, met briefly earlier on. This is a great quotation. I almost thought of using that, but I can never. <laughs> Cope with it. That's a word. Um, yeah. it's, a, it's an interesting one, though, because um, he's not wrong, is it? It's just slightly compressed, perhaps. Actually, the, apparently, David Snowden wrote that. Is that correct? He claims that he claims. Okay, so we have Snowden to blame. We have Snowden coming in. Some of the problems that Rumsfeld. Um, it will be. Yeah, because you may know that Rumsfeld. I mean, you have frankly resigned recently. Yes. Um, um, he was a great champion of this notion of leveraging, as he said, leveraging technology in order to make super efficient armed forces for the United States' future. And the great thing he saw about this, the great opportunity that he saw, was this, that this would make armed force a far more valuable to the policy, far more useful to the policy, foreign policy, yes, for the United States. That because a significant investment in new technologies um, would make the US armed forces so much more efficient than their, their enemies. Um, it became far easier to contemplate using them in practice. And trying to reframe this idea in the, in the terms we've been using earlier on, um, the risks of doing too much were no longer present, because you could always virtually guarantee of destroying your enemy because you were so much more efficient than them. But the risks of applying too much force and the operation becoming too costly, according to Rumsfeld, would virtually disappear. And therefore, you could conceive of using massive amounts of force, really elegantly perhaps, but with highly efficiently, in order to achieve political objectives. So, in a sense, the effect this had, if you are a critic of the Bush administration, would be to say that this helped militarize US foreign policy. That the Americans no longer had to talk to people and understand people all that much if they could bomb them efficiently. Yes, you could just simply use your force to achieve foreign policy objectives at far less risk than previously been the case. Now, this is very important because it meant that the Pentagon, the United States Department of Defense, came to have an extremely important influence over US foreign policy after 2001. When the United States was attacked from New York and um, the, the Twin Towers and the Pentagon were attacked in 2001. This changed much of the United States' attitudes towards threats emanating from overseas. Principal one, apart from Al-Qaeda, which, to be honest, nobody knew very much about and was a very shady organization. The principal one that people were worried about was Saddam Hussein in Iraq. <coughs> Iraq had a track record of aggression, um, and it was hypothesized, yes, within 12 hours, actually, of the attacks on the United States, that Iraq was probably somehow bound up in the whole terrorist attack business, yes, that it was likely to have given aid to Al-Qaeda. And what is more, the Iraqi weapons of mass destruction programs, Saddam Hussein's attempts to acquire chemical and nuclear weapons, looked far more threatening than had previously been the case, in the, because people began to worry quite quickly that he would provide these kinds of technologies to terrorists in the future. Interestingly, um, Saddam Hussein did have a relationship with Al-Qaeda. Um, you may or may not be aware of it. They tried to kill him three times, actually. Al-Qaeda <laughs> tried to assassinate um, Saddam Hussein three times. But this, this was not something that came to light for a little while. Um, 
which just goes to show you really need to know what's going on in the world of it in order to make appropriate strategic decisions. What was the US response? Well, basically, any other state in the world would have had to think very, very hard about the risks associated with attacking Iraq, invading Iraq, versus the risks associated with leaving Saddam Hussein in power and what he might do in terms of who he would give things to, who he would help around the world. But most states in the world would have to balance those two forms of risk. The United States was sufficiently confident in 2001 it could invade Iraq, topple Saddam Hussein, end of problem. So the risk of weapons of mass destruction, the risks of proliferation to non-state terror terrorist actors, um, could be tackled decisively by low-risk application of force. This is what he's tried. 2003, March 2003. The United States had some hangers-on, I think, yes, invade Iraq. Now, Interestingly, the first stage of the war, yeah, the first stage of the war, the first few weeks, goes very well indeed. Yeah? The US armed forces destroy pretty much rapidly, decisively, Iraqi regular opposition. The irregular Iraqi army disintegrates under pressure of US superior technique. Nothing it can do to stop the Americans. Thereafter, things go rather badly. Yes. Once the United, the United States has succeeded in making its enemy defenseless, destroying the Iraqi armed forces, topples Saddam Hussein, something happens which it had wholly unexpected, which is that the Iraqi people themselves become the enemy in exchange, instead of the Iraqi state. But a combination of religious and nationalist passions combine to start an insurgency that is conducted by elements of the Iraqi people. So the United States Armed Forces, having toppled their rogue state, the leader of this rogue state, find themselves unexpectedly embroiled in what amounts to, well, it's not quite civil war, yeah? but it is a major insurgency in Iraq, which is draining away the Americans' ability to operate, and in fact no will to operate at the same time. What do the Americans try and do to respond to this? They don't know what to do. They have no sense of who these people are, at least initially. Is it Al-Qaeda? Is it remnants of the Ba'athists? Is it Shia militants, Sunni militants? Who knows? Uh, disconcertingly, one major intelligence major in US um, army division that's operating in Baghdad came to the conclusion. They're just simply bad people. If you get bad people in any society, these are the people who are attacking us. They would never, they'll never be happy, yes? And the only thing we can do is to destroy them. So the US armed forces, basically what you see them trying to do in Iraq, um, with some care and attention, is trying to get out these insurgents, find out who they are, locate them physically, and then they kill them off. And from time to time you'll hear their offenses on the news that are you know, launched. The problem, of course, is that these insurgents operate in the midst of Iraqi society itself in Baghdad, in Basra, in all the major cities. And the challenge you have is targeting these people without killing civilians in the process. And in many respects, what these insurgents try to do is to incite coalition forces to overreact to an act of aggression. So what, what the insurgents will sometimes do is blow up something or capture some um, American prisoners and then they will shoot them and mutilate them or some such sort of action, knowing that this will enrage the United States and that they will take, undertake military offensive in order to get the people who they think are responsible for these atrocities, knowing in the process that this will kill lots of Iraqi civilians and that Iraqi civilian um, um, opinion, and in fact world opinion at large, will be mobilized against the United States as a result of what people see US forces doing on the television and the news. So there's a very complex, sophisticated insurgency going on that the United States gave very little attention to. The prospect of doing this, the prospect of insurgency, was not seriously considered by the Pentagon. Paul Wolfowitz, who you may have known, he was quite instrumental in the early stages of persuading George Bush Jr. to go to war, now moved to the World Bank, actually, but um, 
he was moved on, fervently believed, as he said, inside every Iraqi there's an American trying to get out. That was his view. So all you have to do is take away Saddam Hussein, take away his security apparatus, and you will have a lot of Iraqis who will be deeply grateful for what you've done and will adopt market forces and democracy and all these kinds of things. And that you will have a democratic beacon in the Middle East, yes, which will be part of a reverse domino effect that will spread throughout the area. This is what Wolfowitz considered would be the case on the basis of absolutely no knowledge about Iraqi society whatsoever. As a result of which, the United States got itself embroiled in a war which it is now, this is a wicked problem. The United States is struggling to figure out what to do about Iraq. And has come to the conclusion rather belatedly that if only we'd known more about our enemy, we would have been able to assess the risks of invading a little bit more carefully. And perhaps the balance between taking Saddam down and leaving him in place could have been weighed up a little more appropriately as a result. Um, I won't hammer the broader lessons for military strategy. Um, basically, it is know your enemy and don't believe in technical fixes to problems. Yes, there is no substitute for political judgment in the formulation of strategies. Um, but there are two lessons I want to maybe draw out with a view to thinking about um, urban transport projects in all this. Um, I mean, I, don't, I know very little about urban transport projects apart from as a consumer, and I'm not always impressed by <laughs> But this may be nothing to do with planets. Yes, there's a very few things going on. The first, the first point relates to complexity. Um, the risks that complex plans generate, I think, may well be a generic issue um, across planning activities. Um, reading across military strategy, it seems that urban transport planners uh, need to strike a balance between modesty and ambition, perhaps. On the one hand, incremental fiddling with something like the British transport system um, perhaps will never fail catastrophically. Your interventions will never produce catastrophic failure, but on the other hand, you will never actually resolve any of the real problems um, decisively that British transport faces at the moment. If you intervene decisively, if as the state or whoever else is acting in this capacity, you say, right, what we're going to do is start from scratch with an ambitious uh, modernisation of um, the UK transport infrastructure, perhaps you will resolve some of the problems um, associated with what is the creaking infrastructure today. On the other hand, yeah, perhaps it will go catastrophically wrong. Yeah? So I suppose there is a middle way to be steered between doing little bits around the margins, repainting the stations, yes, and moving away from railways or roads or motorways altogether and inducing something else. You know, but between those two extremes, there is a middle way, and I suppose what planners have to do is assess the risks associated with each of those outcomes. Um, the second part is, is one relating to adversarial behaviour. And this, I think, is more than a question rather than a conclusion. Um, is the adversarial dimension of military planning unique? Um, to me, at least, transport initiatives, as reported on the media, frequently seem to embody some um, adversarial content. This may manifest itself as outright dissent in relation, for example, to the introduction of building of a new bypass or something similar like that. But there are adversarial relations to be managed then. It's also the case, I think, that large transport projects must attract um, various stakeholder groups, and those stakeholders are each going to have slightly different um, interests and wishes and things that they want to bring in and see reflected in the plans that emerge as a result. Um, now, presumably, uh, the question of whose views ultimately predominate in these kinds of discussions around any physical artifact like a motorway or a bypass whose views predominate probably rests on the resources and the strategies that the different groups can bring to bear. Um, so that pressing your case, in a sense, will depend on how efficient or effective you are at bringing various resources, voices, and so on and so forth, to bear on this subject. Um, and I would have thought that under such circumstances, actual physical resistance from environmental protesters, for instance, 
or nimbi gorillas, I decided, would be uh, interesting. Um, is only the most extreme expression yeah, of a struggle that is normally carried out with words rather than with force of arms. Yeah, but large planning projects are ultimately, again, I'm presuming, emergent properties of lots of people sitting around tables arguing about things, negotiating about things, and sometimes you give away certain things, and sometimes you press your point, and ultimately out of this pops the plan that you try and impose on the countryside and whatever. Now, hidden away in there, I am sure a fairly bit of adversarial relations going on. That's that I was, I was um, saying to Harry earlier on, I became aware of this personally originally because I'm Opposing a planning um, project. Opposite my flat where I live, there is a, there is a proposal to open a 24 hour mini cab office, which you could imagine the kinds of problems that that might cause me at three in the morning and things. Um, and my feeling about this, this my, my, my role in this little sort of um, Islington Council local democracy thing is that I'm, I'm, an, I'm, I'm entering into this in the spirit of adversarial <laughs> relations with the people who want that office to be open. You know, I don't want it to be open. Now, I'm not going to walk over and fire on the place, yes, because the risks associated with doing that outweigh the benefits I'm likely to um, um, achieve. And also, there are cultural and ethical constraints acting on me, I suppose. Um, but below that threshold, there are various things that I'm going to do that are an adversarial or competitive um, sort of spirit, like writing strong letters to the council, for instance. Now, that seems to me to be I would sort of lessen almost all planning of complex projects and problems. Because once you get complex projects, you get disagreement about what the end result should be like. And the squabbling, one way or another, has to be resolved. And I imagine that part of that squabbling is resolved by negotiation and concession. But some of it somehow will be resolved by people cutting their cut down in one way or another. Yeah. And, um, forcing results on people who uh, otherwise are willing to have them um, imposed on them. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Eddie. Yeah. Thanks. Questions and comments? Not so much on the Iraq war, the military strategy of the Americans, but on the generic. I'd like to make a comment because it gives you Game theory. The game, game theory is an interesting development. I mean, it's a late 1950s sort of development. Yes, um, yeah. quite a lot of famous people that mm. worked on this strategy of the Americans connected to. Yeah, the, the best known is Tom Schelling, the, yes. the political economist. Yes. Um, How did the, um, yes. I mean, he was actually influential in advising McNamara on what to do in Vietnam, or trying to. He, he actually gave up, as I just don't know, what you should do. Um, Schelling is interesting. I mean, he, he makes a lot of game theory in his work, on, um, which, is, which is broader than simply military strategy. I mean, he's interested in conflict, per se. Um, if you look carefully at what Schelling is doing there, and a variety of his um, colleagues who were sort of writing on the same themes at that time, they tend to use game theory not so much as a way of exploring issues, per se, but of explaining them. But game theory at the time was in the social sciences in the United States, not so much in Britain, but in the United States, a very, very important part of the discourse uh, in, in the late 50s, early 60s. And in order to be taken seriously, uh, the serious social scientists or whatever, Schelling and his colleagues used the notions of game theory to explain issues that they derived at by other means. Which is not to say that game theory didn't become quite important as a result of that, 
But the, the big thing about game theory was, um, I mean, I, I'm stretching my knowledge a little bit here, was um, a way of battering the United States armed forces um, with a, a sort of scientific um, rationale for strategic decisions that the United States armed forces couldn't understand. Yeah? It was a tool that civilian strategists mobilized in order to get their views taken seriously by the Pentagon and the White House. Um, because numbers have an authority, yes, that mere words and the experience of generals doesn't necessarily convey. Um, the big problem for game theory, of course, was those numbers. The numbers that went in the boxes, in the, in the grids, were numbers that basically got made up. You know? And this, begin, this brings us back, in a sense, to the issue about um, political judgment and knowledge of your enemies. If the various outcomes of those boxes um, are going to at all reflect what your enemy and what you're, you are after, you still have to know an awful lot about your enemy in order to be able to put plus 100 at one side and minus 95 at another. So there was still this requirement, while game theory provided an interesting methodology, you still needed to be able to import some data from somewhere. And that was one of the fundamental problems, or the critiques that was leveled at game theory, that somehow it had lost its content, its contact with the world of politics, um, became something that was sort of um, self-referential as a result. But it was an important way you know, sort of theorizing strategic behavior in the 50s and 60s. Um, war is an extension of diplomacy by other means. Yeah. Um, and uh, what you spoke about um, suddenly has application for many uh, mega projects as they are actually handled by suspect, um, involving some sort of um, negotiation um, mm -hmm. on the basis of conflict and competition. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm, while you're talking, I'm thinking, how can this is applied? How can we apply it to what we're looking at here? Um, I, you know, I think it's a critical question, you know, how much are mega project decisions based on the sort of strategies and tactics of conflict? Mm -hmm. um, but always bearing in mind that um, quite a lot of the literature on, on this suggests that um, it's a consensus book from the very start, mm -hmm. uh, which I guess is a, a sort of a different paradigm. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I doubt if that comes very much into the sphere of thinking about war, I mean, um, military conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not, you know, the, the people do not sit down with their enemies and um, sort of try to understand their goals <laughs> in a nice kind of way. But it's possible in, mm -hmm. in many projects to try to uh, deliberate um, sort out the different goals of different stakeholders and around mega projects. Mm. Try and find ways of achieving at least some of their, these different goals in a certain outcome, which may or may not result in the mega project going ahead. I'd, I'd sort of prefer to see, see, see the way that actually Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, I mean, I think probably there is, there is conflict somewhere in mega projects, but I'm not quite yes. sure how it manifests itself in a sense. Consensus building, though, I mean, I think one could take the view that war is, in many respects, about consensus building, because lots of wars, if you think about it, end without one, most all wars almost end without one side being completely destroyed. The Cuban, the Cuban is a great example of consensus, because there is, there is competition, but underlying that competition, there is also a profound sense on both sides, that if we don't cooperate, even in competition, we're all going to die. So that sort of sense of building a consensus um, around the competition in a sense and finding some solution short of killing each other is, is a sort of important lesson that people like Shelling were trying to bring out. The problem is, of course, that you know, the military is the sort of executive part of this process. They're not trained or temperamentally sort of inclined to that view of war. I mean, what war was was making the enemy dead, really. Um, and if you didn't do that, they'd do it to you. And I think this is where the tension arises between the military and the political level. You know, that the military has a fear of not doing enough, and the politicians have a fear of doing too much. And that really is highlighted by the nuclear issue. And that for people like Shelley, and what the strategy was an exercise in consensus building. Um, but I suspect, I mean, I, 
I wouldn't want to push these analogies too far. So I, I throw them out for people to say, you know, yeah, that's quite interesting. Oh no, that's the load of one bridge. But at least you've heard, in a sense, the kinds of ways in which the military think about it. I am quite suspicious of business. Well, the, the kind of books I see in the LSE bookshop from time to time, which is the sort of the ten secrets of business success, you know, <laughs> by Major General Clusterbomb or whatever. You know, you know, you, you import a military paradigm onto your business, and um, you're going to destroy your opponents and so on and so forth. I'd be very hesitant to kind of import concepts um, as uncritically as that. Uh, yeah, John Adams from here from UCL. Uh, in a couple of months' time, I've been invited to participate in a conference at RUSI, the Royal United Services Institute, for those who are from here, uh, on threats to critical national infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Some of which is principle related, obviously. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm hoping you can help me write my paper. <laughs> uh, I, 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 the, you give me so much to think about. Um, but a, we're dealing in, in trying to conceptualize risks, threats. Mm. We're dealing with a, a different type of enemy, the suicide bomber mentality. Mm. Uh, and one problem seems to be that the precautionary principle allied to a vivid imagination mm -hmm. can bankrupt any government. Yep. Uh, and an issue that I hope will arise in, the, uh, in this conference that I'm struggling with is how, given the scenarios that one can construct, feasible, plausible scenarios mm -hmm. of you know, dirty bombs in the city of London and things like that, um, what resources does one contemplate committing to uh, uh, defending against these threats? Yeah. How long have we got? <laughs> <laughs> a few minutes, right? Okay. Let's discuss that. Let, yeah, let, 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 me, that. Yeah, yeah. let me just try and sort of encapsulate that. If, I mean, first of all, you've got to know who you're up against. And I think, you know, if you take Al Qaeda as being a monolithic organization, the point of all arguments, um, and it has various franchises around the world. <clears throat> Um, you've got to try and figure out how serious they are about what it is they want to achieve and separate rhetoric, which is a large part of the um, strategy actually, from the realities of what they think they're going to do. Because you're right, the, the number of technical problems or technical threats that you might want to try and secure yourself against is endless. So you have to make some, you have to reduce the, you have to take some risks. Yes and focus on the things that you think are most likely to be attacked or under threat. And that obviously leaves out a large number of things. So you can only really take that kind of risk with confidence, I suppose, to make those judgments, if you have some sense of what the opposition is likely to do and not do. Um, you can, to a certain extent, try and figure out what motivates Al-Qaeda. And there's a lot of people pondering this. I mean, there's a whole industry in mind area of the world at the moment. Lots of books and lots of research money in, in, inside the cave of our, uh, you know, Osama bin Laden kind of um, books. Um, where strategy can help, I think, is this cost-benefit issue, which has to be approached carefully. But let me just encapsulate the issue with one simple example. If Al-Qaeda had a nuclear bomb um, in the British Isles, and it was thinking about what to do with it, if anything, how likely is it that it would actually use it to destroy the center of London? It's an interesting question. On the one hand, you might be very worried. You might say, this is the worst thing I can think of. Bombing Trafalgar Square, bang, off it goes. It destroys the center of London, it kills millions of people. Um, worst calamity we can think of. We must defend ourselves against this. We do everything possible. Yes. Um, how likely is Al-Qaeda to try and do that? Because Al-Qaeda, at some level, operates within its own framework of political costs and benefits. But the challenge for Al-Qaeda is to keep itself irritating enough, you know, make life miserable for people, perhaps, so that it always keeps itself on the political agenda, forces states to engage in some sense or another, and inches its way towards whatever its political aims are. The problem with being Al-Qaeda is that if you let off a bomb, a nuclear bomb in London, you make it really worth 
everybody else is wild to cover the extermination. Okay? Now at the moment, what's holding Western states back from dealing with the problem of Al-Qaeda in a purely military way is the fact that there isn't the domestic and international sympathy for that kind of effort. Yeah? This is not felt to be worth our while. Our lives may be made miserable and a little bit exciting and due from time to time, but none of us is going to vote for a war of extermination of Al-Qaeda. If a bomb were to go off, a nuclear weapon were to go off in London or New York, that would be a sufficient event for it to mobilise the entire world, and not just the Western world, but a lot of the Muslim world as well, perhaps, against these people. Um, so, Al Qaeda, I think, would be very cautious if it had a bomb about what it would do. So, there are some ways in which you can use that notion of strategic cost benefit analysis to try and draw a circle around the things that you think um, you need to worry about, and there's some of the things that you don't need to worry about. That's how I sleep at night, yes. <laughs> As a rational actor, I don't have anything to worry about. It's only to be rational. But we could talk more about it. Because it is difficult. Political judgment um, has to have to be made about what you defend is yourself, yourself against and what you ignore. It's been an interesting paper, actually. I'll just try and quickly summarise uh, where we're running today. One point that I, sh I should uh, emphasize from the outset is it's, it's implicit that it needs to be said. It, it is a, a strategy is clearly seen as a planning response to uncertainty, risk, and complexity. And in that regard, I would have thought that that is a starting point for much of our research. It is a search for strategic thinking as opposed to uh, thinking about a project. Um, so that's, that, that, that looks at the project and the context. Um, so that's one point. The second point is um, the assumption, which is a point that you concluded on, and, uh, that the other party are rational and use and share the same values. I think we need to examine that <coughs> hypothesis, whether the rationality of the infrastructure planner takes into account the rationality of those impacted by the projects? Is it a bounded rationality? Thirdly, um, I think this is extremely significant. As we have um, the new regionalism agenda and globalization encourage us to believe that the way the world works is based upon competitiveness, and if we are to take competitiveness as the engine of the global economy, Let's look at how competitors deal with each other. It isn't the adversary. And yet, let's look at how we read uh, what books have been written in planning literature, collaborative planning, partnership. Um, either we're in denial that there is adversary planning against planners, or against the plan, or against being controlled by a plan. There is certainly an adversary approach adopted by some vested interests and planners are in denial and pretending that actually we're all sitting around a dory around a table trying to arrive at a consensus. Um, understanding knowing adversaries before acting, I think that perhaps we can conclude in many mega transport projects that that's probably the last thing that many investors actually do. They are more interested in investing in a network that will get their users and their, their freight around from A to B or um, from one part of the globe to the other, um, they're not, unless I'm mistaken, or if maybe I should be asking a question, not making judgments here, it would be useful to find out in our projects the extent to which the project investors get to know those that are affected by the projects. Um, some sinister linkages for a moment. There is a strong link between infrastructure development and infrastructure destruction and the military. And this has come out if you look into construction companies. I'm, I'm not advocating this at all dark and nasty, but I'm just saying that these are facts if you want to look at them. Halibut, um, Bechtel, there are relationships. Sometimes uncomfortable, 
Certainly, infrastructure development post war is a lucrative business. Um, what seems to be bizarre, and it's interesting that John raised it just a moment ago, so maybe it's not as bizarre, but it's bizarre it hasn't come up before now, is actually realizing that mega transport projects are strategic infrastructures to be protected. Um, utilities and uh, the, the Americans have picked up on this when it came to privatization of some of their ports. It seems, it seems a, a contradiction with the uh, neocons on one hand to advocate globalization. Uh, well, I suppose it's not so bizarre, you think, as long as it's one way traffic. Um, it, to, to sort of have ownership uh, of strategic infrastructure by you is good for business. But to have someone else owning your strategic infrastructure, as the French will remind us, and the Germans, is not good. Here in Britain, we sell our grandma, so we can sell any infrastructure. <laughs> anyway. um, making up numbers. I was able to pick this up in your, well, and this is Ben Fluvius' argument, is it not? But basically, you, you make up the numbers to fit the case. So we've got parallels there. Um, I actually was intrigued by your comment about that there is mm -hmm. the American linear free market trying to get out of it. Yeah. I think that the neocons and the free marketeers believe that there are free marketeer rationalists within us trying to get out. That they actually believe that we all believe in a free market with non intervention. And if only you can be persuaded, then you will support this. Um, so there is some of that. Then there's the demonization of the adversity. Well, demonization of community groups, demonization of community groups, of investors. But there are some uncomfortable parallels coming out here, are there not? Most significant of all, this goes back to Malcolm Gladwell, who I've mentioned this already today, is the voice of the crowds. The parallels what's happened as a response to the military technological successes created a greater power amongst the crowd. I think this could happen with mega projects if executed with little care, little thought. And that at some stage, particularly in the developing world, where there are the winners and losers, and you already start off with more than 50% of many of the third world uh, cities being losers anyway, that they will see the few winners becoming even bigger winners. But hey, with a 36% increase in uh, travel costs in London announced last week, I'm beginning to <coughs> lose as well. Um, so maybe we don't have to look at the developing world for that. Um, I think we just have a. I liked your comment about rhetoric and strategy. Well, we ought to invite Mr. Blair when he resigns. I think there are there are enough there. It, it actually kind of surprises me. I don't know if it surprised the audience. Um, it surprises me how much there was there. Just thoughts, not facts, just areas of investigation. Um, to conclude. I, I too was approached, actually by the US military, and actually made this public to the people. I was approached by the US military last year to attend a, a seminar in Washington to give them advice on, I don't know if I mentioned this, on military tactics in the city. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they, they just relate to mega projects, mega cities, and, and they attach defense. I declined the invitation uh, for lots of reasons. But it, 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 is, it is an area where uh, clearly planners and infrastructure planners are needing, needed to be talking to the military, vice versa. It is an area of significance. So thank you again. Okay, thank you very much.